I like outdoor advertising. I just don't think it ought to be outdoor. And it's not a question of aesthetics. It's simply that it invades. I can't close it up. I can't throw it away. It's just there, whether I like it or not. Welcome to the Woodshed. Hey, welcome to another Woodshed. Uh, really excited about this show. We're doing something a little bit different. We're going to be talking about uh, definitely one of my heroes, uh, a, a person that I never met, but uh, but has been really influential for CPB, and that's Howard Luck Gossage. This is a San Francisco ad man. He uh, was very influential for us at CPB, but we just did a little informal survey and asked around how many people had heard of him. And I think maybe 30% was roughly the number of creatives, <laughs> maybe lower. They're telling me lower than 30%. Tragic. It is a little tragic. It's a little tragic. Um, and uh, the reason that it's tragic is because the guy fucking was brilliant. And we can't even cover all the brilliant stuff that he did I think in it's, this show. It's also interesting. I think that just his very nature was sort of outsider anyway. First of all, you're in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And I like would venture to say, I mean, obviously his agency isn't around anymore. It wasn't. It wasn't. I mean, at the time, San Francisco was not the ad market. Yeah, exactly, that it exactly, became, exactly. For sure. a very outsider to be yeah. in San Francisco. Yeah. And he, I don't think, counts as one of those um, rock star, I guess, or what? Like, it's not. He's not like an old. Kind of like a separate. Like kind of like a yeah. separate thing. And in years ago, Jeff Goodby and Bruce um, Bendinger and a few other people got together, and I think decided to write a book about him. And that is the book of Gossage. And um, I think they wrote the book at the time because they realized here's a guy that was an outsider a bit, but but really brilliant. And they wanted to capture everything that he did. And and it hit it. It's just an amazing time for us at CPB, like a really essentially at the same time <clears throat> we were hitting our stride and the Internet was becoming a becoming really, a thing really big thing. It was like, you know, it was I mean, honestly, like, wait a Google. minute. I oh, need go to go ahead. I'm sorry. I just have to stop because I didn't introduce you. Joining me on the show is uh, Mike Howard, who is a creative director, been a creative director for a long time now. A little bit. A couple yeah. weeks. No, I'm joking. Yeah. For, for quite a while. <laughs> but you started as my assistant. That's right. I was. Is uh, that embarrassing for me to bring up? No, not even a little bit. Okay. It's, a, it's a great. It's actually a really great story. I, I was an intern for five credits, um, spent all my free time. Uh, at my internship that they, I think you guys gave me like lunch money, which uh -huh. was really fun, but it was more fun than class. And then uh, at the end of my internship, while I was still in school, he, uh, Alex hired me as his secretary. Um, is that, that secretary, is that PCB? I don't know. Yeah, I, don't I know think anymore. so. Okay. But you called me. But you were, which you were fun. terrible. Horrible secretary. Terrible. Horrible. But I did, it was a lot of fun. And these were back in the days before like Google image search. Yeah. B literally before Google right. image we search. We would just look through books of stock photography. Exactly. That was a big part of my job was just going out and he would give, the creators would give me like shopping lists yeah. and uh, I would go to the, to the most insane place, spend my entire day shopping for stuff for cops to make, right. to make ads out of. And then they would shoot them, which was. And speaking of books. And speaking so, of books. So this book came out and Bill Wright, who's, who was a copywriter at the agency at the time, um, said, Hey, have you read this? And, and I hadn't, I read it. And then I, I, I think I probably sent you out to buy us <laughs> I'm sure. you know, yes. enough copies for the whole creative department. That's absolutely true. Yeah, there were a bunch of little errands like that that I got to do. And uh, and I still have mine. And I think a lot of people, it's funny because I still work with, uh, I've worked with a lot of other people who were around at that particular time and they all still drag it around from one agency to the next. The book. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. You see it on pretty much every bookshelf of anyone who was there at the time. And uh, the... The book came out at a time that was really, we were sort of beginning to hit our stride, I think, really early though. Um, and uh, and Jeff Goodby and Bruce Bendiger and some other people put together this book to capture the life of this, this man who was a hero to them, became a hero to a lot of people, but was also an outsider, I think. Not, not a New York ad um, guy, not a New York or Chicago ad person. Yeah. And, and when you think about things that were happening in San Francisco at that particular point in time, he was, um, he had sort of a salon mentality about his agency and the people that he hung around with. Like, you know, he was, he was friends with John Steinbeck, who's friends mm -hmm. with Tom Wolf, like, um, um, Marshall McLuhan at the time, mm -hmm. Ken Kesey, um, 
all these people who are sort of countercultural. And he, in his own way, while not a hippie, is definitely a piece of San Francisco early counterculture. Yeah. Very the beginnings of sort of that San Francisco progressive absolutely. mentality. Absolutely. Think, yeah. Right? Yeah. Not a hippie at all. Not even slightly. Like no, maybe you, smoked a pipe. Yeah. And, madman. Total madman. Like, like yeah. look to the look the part of a madman. Yeah. But. Not a hippie. But his but his work was was weird. It was really weird. And I, I think for us, the thing that that was so exciting about it and a lot of people didn't get. And I think still today, a lot of people don't don't understand. It's hard to draw the line. The to between what he was doing and what we're doing and what if you're in an agency now, what you're doing. Yeah, absolutely. There is absolutely. a direct line and it's a much easier line for me. It's a much easier line to draw from his philosophies than from Ogilvy's philosophies. Ogilvy's philosophies, I you know, not this is going to sound negative. There's no diss. But there's a lot of rules. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And and this is sort of the anti-rules yeah, his version whole, of rules. I feel like when you look through his advertising, his whole his whole take was a piss take on advertising. Right. And I, I think it's I mean, I think it's because he hated it. Like mm-hmm. he he saw and even if you think I've about, always hated yeah, it. Yeah. And I think I honestly think that people who hate it tend to be better at it because they want to make something that isn't. And you don't and like I said that once in an interview. And and it was a somebody it was a writer from Brazil where they really liked like like advertising. advertising. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And they said, you know, why why do you love advertising? And I was like, <laughs> I don't. I I kind of hate it. And his face was so heartbroken. It was it was I I was like, I wait, let me let me adjust. Well, it's become a thing, right? Like it it is a diss in an agency world or an agency environment to hear something that something is too addy. And what That's I an ad, and and it's an what but what I I it wasn't that I I I had to correct and I and I the finer point is. It isn't. Um, I I love the people. I love the things that have happened. I love the history, but I believe that it's designed. It's very of the moment, and so it's designed to change all the time. And so to so to have too much respect for a thing that is it, disposable. That is disposable. Yeah, in right. its current form, can keep you from iterating on it. Agreed, one hundred percent. That was it's funny too because you do it, there's. I'm sure there's plenty of schools of thought, but there is that is very hard to to get across the idea that you believe advertising is a disposable thing and needs to just be constantly refreshed yeah. when when so many people regard it as, I guess, art. And that's not and that I'm again, but not, art's not the same way. Dense. Art, you know, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, I went to an exhibit of Moreau and like as you walked in, the first thing it said was sort of his treatise on what he was trying to do and it, and it was i'm going to attempt to assassinate art it's, it's and, an and it was and it was amazing as you watched him sort of dis, you know disassemble art and take a big piss take at yeah. the whole thing and then he did it for so long that he had to do it about his own work exactly self-referential um, yeah so then he had to tear himself apart with his own art, which is genius, it's really, great. really, really genius. It's and, great. And and when you go in back to Gossage, it's funny because hanging around with Marshall McLuhan, like that was his, his whole thing was about. First of all, he he predicted the internet maybe thirty years before it actually yeah. happened. So you've got you know that influence on everything. The Gossage. This is did. the medium is the message. The medium is the message. Is yeah, it exactly. medium or media? It's medium. Medium. Yes. His yes. his theory was that the effect I always of get it the wrong. medium. There's more than one medium. It's a media. <laughs> Got it. Okay. <laughs> no worries. Uh, but that was really interesting. You know, I also think that McLuhan is famous for thinking that um, advertising was high art and not in the way that it needs to be precious and perfect, but because yeah. it's it, great art has an effect on you mm-hmm. and and it should be maybe something more than just, uh, you know, how much cash goes in the register. Yeah. And what was what was cool about Howard is he would collect these people mm-hmm. and he would, you know have them like you said a salon I have so them. his office this is a really small potential piece of influence but his office was in a firehouse right exactly in san francisco exactly and years later when we built this office <laughs> i put in several fire poles not and just one it's an important point no i don't know if it matters how many <laughs> But and I don't know if it was just that I like to do things that I wanted to do when I was 12. And, you know, I try to like exactly. go back to that. But but uh, but I, I would bet that it was also very much in, no, it was put it was, in my head yeah. because he had one. I mean, firehouse is even just the environment in and of itself is like a pretty great like starting point. Being in a church, being in an old church, yep. an old firehouse, something like that. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, 
So one of the things that that uh, that he did, that if you that if you haven't heard about him and you and you probably wouldn't know, was he seemed to be just a freak for coupons. Like that was the if there's one thing I would say, absolutely, it, it was that he was a freak for coupons. Now for me, that translated into into something a little bit bigger, which is like he really wanted to he he was dying to have a conversation with his audience, with the people on the other side of that ad. And when I read the book. And the internet's coming, yeah. and all these things that that he you could feel the longing in every ad, like, oh, can I connect yeah. with you? Yeah, exactly. And we used to talk about that conversation a lot, and it suddenly was way easier. Um, that was that was I just I in a lot of ways I felt like God, thank God he's not still alive because he would just <laughs> kick our ass. Yeah. <laughs> so crush it. And it was like all the tools that we have available to us that were the tools that he may, maybe dreamed or yeah. would have dreamed of having. Um, I think there was something. It was and funny. like was, you said, he probably knew we're, we're coming because Marshall McLuhan's like, yeah, this is probably coming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ab absolutely. It was yeah. part of like his, like, I guess, media theory. Yeah. The other thing um, where that is concerned is I, I remember reading something about how he regarded advertising as, as in general, a mask for a corporation to hide behind. Mm -hmm. um, and we didn't understand how like that poor, could be communicated. Poor advertising. Exa exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so, and exactly said that, Basically, he wanted something that was more conversant, yeah, and and would and he believed genuinely speaking that you would reach a certain kind of person mm -hmm. um, with a, with a with a voice that would that would speak to them rather than uh, at them, I guess. Which yeah, is the thing we were always yeah trying to do. And when we and and it was funny because at the time people were applying traditional advertising to the internet. I don't know if you remember, yeah, absolutely. and no one was having an. A, a conversation through it. I shouldn't say no one. It was very rare. It was, very rare. It was not happening in advertising. Yeah. And and uh, one of his. I wait. I wanted to say one other thing. There's a term. I mean, there's many things that he coined, but we were talking about one. Yeah. Earlier. Yeah. Lemons and lemonade. Like yeah. If your life, if it's it wasn't. If you ever it's used, like, if you ever get a, if you ever get a lemon, make lemonade. That's how he put it. That's how he put it. Yeah. And it's it's, it's become. I mean, that's unbelievable that he that For, that's his sayings. Fucking Shakespearean. It's completely right? Shakespearean. Yeah. I mean, it's so colloquial now. Right. And no, and yet 30% of the creative department on, only right. or do, lower does doesn't it, even they know. Don't, well, they don't know they know him. <laughs> exactly. But they know that. That's yeah. Exactly right. So you so you do know him. The there's a there's an ad, there's an ad that's pretty famous. Well, if you know Howard, right. And if you know this this sort of era about coupons, um, where he, he was doing FINA gas stations and he launched this ad probably Probably in the New York Times, I would think. I would and, think. In the in San Francisco, San Francisco Chronicle. Chronicle. Yeah. 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 Um, and the headline is send, send in for your free sample of pink air. It's so arch. I and, love it. And he's 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 taking a piss out. He's taking the piss out of the fact that they were adding coloring to gasoline at the time. Exactly. Yeah. And so, so some gases had blue, some were red, some were, you know, and they were trying to suggest that these additives are what made them different. And the truth was, they're exactly the they're same. Exa it's just, it's like, and what, it, what's great is gas with food color. The actual, the actual ad undoes the claim of pink air really wonderfully because it's, yeah. of course, you can't, once it's in the tire, you can't tell what color it is anyway. And we couldn't even send it to you if you wanted it to. So they, he, so he basically just asked people to write in and he would send them a pink balloon. He would send a pink balloon, which yeah. is sort so of you, how it looks. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> it would approximate once you blew it up what pink air would look like. Yes, it appears as though it may be filled with pink hair. Um, is there something? I mean, the the I'm not trying to draw comparisons. Um, I'm more inspiration. So we also so I've got I've got Howard's uh, or the or the book of Gossage, um, and then we've got our book. I think you got to go later on. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Right. Um, um, I always think about Molson. Molson is a good one. Twin label technology. Yeah. See if you can find that, but okay. we can talk about that. Um, even from a design perspective, and it's like obviously you know modernized with Molson, but when uh, this is, I'm trying to think of when this was the 2000, early 2000s probably. I'm when sure. We had Molson. Yeah. And the idea was that beer, everyone's making this claim that beer actually says something about you. Well, the planners um, went to they were at bars and and they noticed that people would arrange their beer in their hands so that the label was always <laughs> pointing out and it was pointing um, to to the uh to whoever i think they found attractive <laughs> that's so that is so funny i didn't i didn't know that oh part you didn't know that no. part so so uh i should say that that the book of ours that we're that we're going through is hoopla 
Um, another book no one's heard of. <laughs> <laughs> fun book though really fun it's fun unless you try to read it and then yeah, it really then hurts your eyes it's like re- maybe maybe get a get a copy made of each page that you want to read um, it's very skimmable it's pink with black type in many areas and it, i still regret it um, oh come on it was, i do it's hilarious yeah i regret it a little because yeah, there, there's stuff that it would be good to read and we made it nearly impossible in places to read because <laughs> we we were so punk rock about it yeah, there was sandpaper on the cover to begin with, right? Yeah, it would, so that it would, it, it, it would fuck with the other two books next to it. It would also damage furniture if you put it down on it. It was very, it was very punk rock. And the and there was a review which I actually loved, which was it felt like going through our trash. It's pretty much exactly what it was like, and that's oh, wait, kind of what we were going for. It was very freeform. There, yeah, there's a it. so people people would aim beers, you know, at at attractive um, people the uh, that they wanted to hook up with. And so we said, well, why not make it easier? You know, because you got to go through these gymnastics. It's like, well, if a bud means this, then I'm like this. And let me try to get to that yeah, yeah, and yeah. point that at you. So, yeah, we did labels, twin label, Molson do? label on the on the front. And and if you're watching, you can see it. But if you're not, if you're on the podcast, <laughs> it had the Molson label on the fl- um, front. And on the back, we made a label like I'm I'm good at um, skinny dipping. Yeah. Mother. Um, my mother knows judo. Yeah. Nice one man mullet. bachelorette party. Yeah, and it, basically there were conversation starters. I mean, which yeah. is <laughs> and they worked like crazy. We tried it in a bar before we launched it because because it was going to cost a million dollars to add another label to these to the line, and so we ran a, a test on premise, and it was like their best on premise night ever. And no went, kidding, went that's bananas. really yeah. that's really great. I was I was there during this period of time. It wasn't involved in the work, and I was so jealous of it. It's really great. I think probably when you, even when you look at the from a design perspective, from a, maybe because the design helps draw the line between. It just looks like it's, it looks like we uh, just tried to make it look like the label. We didn't do anything fancy nope. there, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> just, no, I'm just saying that this to me, I it's, it's an example of drawing a very clear line between Gossage and, and what we were trying to do at the time. I think yeah, I think it's a great example, and and uh, and definitely inspired by the fact that he wanted to have a conversation, and then could we facilitate conversations? that people were having and kind of take a, take the piss out of the fact that the notion that a beer means says a anything says at all about something you. about right. you, you know, this and beer does the talking for you. It's true, but it's also boring, right? Yeah. Completely. So, yeah. <laughs> um, another thing that, that, uh, and you probably, That's you great. seem, you seem to really be dialed on Gossage actually. You know, it, it's, uh, Cause I was going to bring up some other aspects, but no, go ahead. Um, I, you know what? It's one of those things where as, as I move, so this is my third time here at this agency. Huh. Um, and I love being back, but what's boomerang, interesting is when you, the, the triple bo- boomerang, triple I'm a triple boomerang, boomerang yeah. at this point. Um, but one of the things, you know, you learn when you go to other different ad agencies and you bring this kind of philosophy with you is that it, it is it, first of all, it's difficult to explain. And, and second of all, I think it's really difficult to, for people to translate unless you're like immersed in that in well in this culture at that at that yeah. particular point in time. Yeah. Um and everything is so clearly like it. Yeah. That um that it just you know it's one of those things that you saw at being effective and I always just sort of liked it because I was from this particular school of advertising. Mm-hmm. And uh and yeah, I don't know. Well as like my assistant, assistant so- like you you were so funny as an assistant because you're terrible with assistant <laughs> stuff, but you're kind of awesome like like extra creative director. So, you know, people would be in my office, we'd be going through work and they'd be pitching things and we'd be working on things. And I would just look up at you and every now and then you just give me this like knowing <laughs> nod, like, yeah. I also I, laugh. I like to laugh, which is, a is I think, a good thing for a it creative was, to have. Honestly, that. it was awesome. And I felt like, I, I'll tell you, even back then, you, I thought this dude is going to be a creative director because he's just, he's soaking in it right now. It's the most, it was the best vantage point ever. And what was funny is I didn't realize he had a, he, Alex had an easy chair. <laughs> it's a weird, it's a loose term for what it was. It was kind of a trashy old, like yellow velvet chair in the corner of his office. And I would do expense reports there. And just because I would love to watch creatives present. And at that point in time, there was, I mean, it was just such a deep bench. It was so fun. And watching those guys present, there was only one guy and he was new. There was one guy who was, I don't want to say he was put off by it, but it was odd to him that when he came in to present work to you, he kind of looked back over his shoulder, saw me there with, you know, my paperwork, <laughs> do what I was doing. He was like, 
Is he always going to be here? Is that the, not, it never even occurred to me that it, it wouldn't. That it was weird. That it was weird. Or yeah. It wasn't allowed or something like that. But I got to see such funny things happen. Yeah. Um, it's the best way to learn the job. I maintain to this day. It was weird, but I think it was <laughs> weird. I think it was weird, but it was really fun for us. Um, so he he also said always he said something to the effect that advertising is not a job for a grown man. Yes. Yeah. I forget the exact quote. I forget it. Too. <laughs> and you, I, we apologize. That, yeah. But but this will be a reason to read the book. Absolutely. It's really intriguing. And 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 later in his life, he he began to work, you know, on things like the Sierra Club. Yeah, a lot of nonprofit, and I yeah. think like I, I just saw, I I do you would think imagine we, do you it think comes we out worked of, on. You think truth, truth is, is, is I mean, there's definitely when you look at the the truth work and the approach, no very, doubt about very it. much influenced, but maybe even the decision that we should do work, that, do that, because the the agency was very split on it, because we had a lot of smokers in the agency, interesting at the time. So that was when I came on board as an intern. Was right after you got the right Florida, got Florida, Florida anti tobacco campaign, yeah. which is the Department of Health, and yeah. then nationally um i think it got more gossipy as it as it became national mm -hmm. uh, particular with particularly with uh i guess it was most visibly in the infect campaign which was a really big deal at the time and basically the the thought process there was rather than doing things to get young people involved in a movement we would give them the tools um and we use that word all the time tools right yeah to to be involved in um the anti-tobacco movement and so the ads then just became instructions all the ads were inserts of tools that you could sort of participate in your own rebellion yeah absolutely and yeah. it was interesting too because i think at that point in time magazines were maybe i'm predating some of it but magazines were kind of hurting for dollars so they were willing to do more fun things oh they did crazy stuff yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, and then fast forward again this is like sort of you have to undo yourself Fast forward like two years from past that, and magazines were stuffed. Yeah. All of them. It got was stuffed. ridiculous. It was. It was so it dumb was so at some dumb. point. Like yeah. the New Yorker in particular, you pick up the New Yorker, which is just like it got you so know, dumb. Erudite. There were four CDs in it, and <laughs> yeah, it got totally out of control. Yeah. It, and I felt re somewhat <laughs> totally responsible. Totally responsible. Yeah. Are you kidding me? <laughs> well, you've opened up this book, which was I think it's the first average. Well, I know it's the first average like that Google Internet Google kind of ever did. Um, why did you open that? It does feel very. Um, is it's gossage. What would be gossage? Gossage, gossage like yeah. gossage esque, gossagean. Yeah, this was it was fun. I think, and if I'm not mistaken, again, I wasn't. I don't think I was here at that particular point in time, but I was loved it. It was a, uh, it was for employment, and so there were, uh, there was a. Uh, but why do you think it's gossage? How, how would so we're looking at a billboard. The billboard, a billboard was an equation. It ran in San Francisco. It's just an equation in brackets with dot com. By the way, also Boston, MIT. I actually got to see it. It did run. It yeah. did run in Boston um, too. Where I lived at that particular yeah. time. So um it was a recruiting campaign. And it Google means was absolutely looking nothing. for more great engineers. Right. And it means absolutely nothing to a lay person. It's to money 90, spent to ninety nine point nine percent of people of who people look, probably even, I would maybe more. Is there even I would like yeah. there's slim, slim integers. First ten digit prime found in consecutive digits of variable E dot com. So Ke it's catchy billboard. It's a catchy billboard. <laughs> no logos. It's white. It's black type on a white billboard. And there's nobody except the people at MIT who would go buy the thing every day. Once you found that dot com, it led you to other. A more problems. So more then you problems. arrived in a sort of anonymous space and you had to solve more um, tough math problems. And eventually it said, congratulations, you've made it through to Google recruiting. To Google recruiting, yeah. which is a really is still and was then a really incredible deal. And then within, you know, I don't know, 60 seconds, people were sharing that, you know, <laughs> yeah. here's how you get there. Here's <laughs> exactly. what that, um, but I think for they, it actually worked really well. They did get really, you know, qualified candidates, which is what they were looking for. And what's funny is I think that that sort of like, uh, that kind of, um, 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 like game in advertising thing, I think, you know, we've seen it a lot since this was at least where, I, as far as I'm concerned, the first time I'd ever seen it done yeah it's so, so deeply too because you know a lot of like news outlets didn't even pass the billboard like they you know would do stories about that billboard but the rest of the stuff was insanely hard like it's absolutely incredible the fa the idea that like that you guys could actually come up with these problems is was genius in and of itself like i you know i don't know who you asked or how you went about the the process but it was pretty incredible this there's another thing that I mean, there's a ton of parallels, but so so there's this ad that Howard did. It's in the book. 
and it says send in for your free eagle it's a that's a shirt <laughs> yeah, company that's great shirt shirt kerchief shirtkin nap chief like with question marks they don't know what to call made it made up word love it made up word made up thing and what it is is it it's a uh, it buttons to it's it's a I guess it's a napkin, napkin with a buttonhole. Yeah. And so it buttons onto your shirt. And I mean, a couple of things come up for me. One is the way we approached gear. Right. So you, you've turned some mini and but but the but the gear for mini where um, like, our, the, like the grab handle. Our or... philosophy with gear is the when the when the brand and that T-shirt come together, it has to make something different. You can't just put you can. But putting the logo on the T-shirt. That's just a, eh. that's just swaggy it's, stuff. Yeah, right? it's exactly. fine. It's fine, but it's not really branding. Exactly. So so we did things like that uh, that sweatshirt where you could unzip just the left uh, sleeve. <laughs> and so that, you so that your, your arm that sticks out while you're driving would get a tan. The other one didn't need to convert. Right, exactly. You, it's, it's inside the now car. You, what are you going to do? It's, yeah, it makes no sense. Um, Doing it for real, I think. Um, That's true, too. Like that's, he that's made, the thing. He had them sew up shirt kerchiefs. Right. You know? So it's one thing to do. And I think it's funny because like your instinct, I think at some point would be to make a funny ad about a thing that you didn't really do. Yeah. And that was always a, I always, that was what made CPB really special back then is like all the stuff was done and made for real and for actual consumption. I don't yeah. even know if anyone ever bought any of the things, but no, they, were they all bought the things. Great. Like, um, there was the G force thing. Well, you did it. You did a thing, which was the fast I did for a thing. Volkswagen, I did a thing for which was a little like, what would you call it? Like, like a, a demon. It was basically like your, it, the idea was that it was, it was a your, demon toy. It was your, uh, your kid robot, like yeah. collectible kind of thing. And, you know, insight being that like the people who love GTIs, and we were relaunching the GTI Mark V at that yeah. point in time, the people who really love GTIs are like geeks for you it. You got this fast inside you yeah. that wanted to come out. So, so it was that, right? But there, I remember the dealers running ads, which was sixteen thousand dollars for a fast, and we'll throw in a GTI. That, <laughs> that's how much they were selling. Yeah, it was pretty yeah. great. And then, and then they, I, you probably know the number, but I remember they were on eBay just the fast. It was People insane. were reselling eight thousand dollars. I think was the highest one I ever okay, saw. Okay, I never saw that. I was gonna say eight hundred. Oh, it might have been eight hundred. Yeah, I right. think it's eight hundred. I think you added that. Yeah. <laughs> you Oops. added a zero to your. Not toy. a good math guy. <laughs> yeah. Um, the the other thing that it makes me think about is is the is the um stuff that 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 we would do like subservient chicken and how confused people were by it at the early like now it's not confusing nope. you kind of get it and now it's actually just old but at the <laughs> but at the time it, I remember the specific confusion and I would say that if I was a client and if I was a person I might have that same con confusion about shirt kerchief <laughs> um, which is how is a shirt kerchief going to sell a shirt? Right. Right. And, um, and I think that the, in this case, it's a little bit harder to explain in some ways than subservient chicken, but because it's, he helps, has another, it fam he has another shirt, famous right. quote we could, we should bring up right now, which is the interesting thing. Yeah. Uh, I forget exactly. people don't read ads. They read th things that interest them. And, and sometimes, sometimes that's an ad. Sometimes that's an ad. Yes. Yeah. And, and that was, man, that hit home for me, you know, and, and with many, we did very, we did long cop, copy outdoor. Yeah. Which is um, a completely, I mean, it's for sitting at stoplights, but no one does more than eight words. I mean, it was like, that's, you know, standard practice. And right. It always has been. Yeah. yeah. But it worked. It totally and, did. and, uh, and we did, we, we inserted those books into it, you know, it was one of the early inserts and that book. When the results came back, that book was more widely read than any of the single in any of the ads, including ads with one line of copy. That's hilarious. So just to, he was right. Yeah. He, right. Well, we had at the same time. Sausage was right. At the same time, we had, and I thought this is so freaking genius. We had uh, business cards that were long copy. There were long copy business cards that all wrote up to the idea to your name. So, and I. I'm forgetting the subject matter of them, but they're really, we definitely really loved funny. long. Yeah, we loved long copy. <laughs> well, there was one about you know we had the one rounded corner, so we said that this business yeah. card is 25 percent safer than right because other put, other agency business you cards. You won't poke your eye out. Right, yeah, exactly. We care about you <laughs> versus those other More agencies. Those other agencies. Yeah, <laughs> those other agencies, they don't care. And it was so great because it's kind of like you know you always hear that the tradition of uh, the sort of like Asian countries where you like regard your credit, yeah. your, your uh, yeah. business card. And here's a card where that actually forces it you. It forces you just look <laughs> just at like, it. Like, yeah. uh, like, you know, three minutes later, you're still like checking out the. Another nice one was the history of the card. I found one That's of those fine. the other day. You did that one. Yeah. Yeah. 
It was the uh, Louis the Louis, yeah. 15th or 14th. I forget. One of those. One of them. Yeah. But yeah, we, they would trade uh They would write cards. their names on tra- playing cards. Exactly. Yeah. And it was sort of like a business, like a business Before card exchange. Before there was business it, cards. Exactly. So we wrote one about that and had Louis on it. <laughs> yes. Yeah. On, the, on the backside. And then that's very Gossage too. Gossage liked to educate you while he was Absolutely, advertising yeah. to you. Yeah, and if you can make it up, that's a lot of fun. And if you if it's real, it's awesome. If you can make it like I always think of the Flahulik. Is it Flahulik? His ad? Yeah, that is his ad. It was um, Flahulik is a is a Gaelic word, and I think it means generosity or you know open open handedness that type of thing. And would sort of like that's how you pronounce it. And if you look at it in Gaelic, you you know it means absolutely nothing. But he would explain it as as it. Uh, regarded to whiskey, I believe Irish whiskey. Yeah. Uh, but then went on to explain, like you know, big napkins, big fluffy napkins are are uh, a flahulik, and the things that aren't flahulik are yeah. welcome match. It was the, the word it was the original farfig nougat. It's exactly right. Right. It meant, and literally the headline was just flahulik, and you'd have to read through the thing to figure what it was. Oh, and they also had gear for that. They had like a pin, and you could designate somebody either flahulik or unflahulik. Unflahulik yeah. being like stingy and jerky. And- so I remember, like, so how does that sell? Uh, Irish whiskey, well, Irish whiskey, yeah. right? So you you know it's that people are interested in you and your company, and I, it's it's and the it's not that com- it's not that complicated. But but what we were doing when we launched um, Subservient Chicken, we did two two or three TV spots at the same time yeah. that we did the yeah. the web activation, the little the game, and no one remembers the TV spots. But I I distinctly remember being on the phone with reporters and them saying, "How on earth?" Did you yes. are, no? Are you gonna? How does this sell? Oh, oh, I see what you're chicken saying. and and or a chicken sandwich and I, and I'm like, you know, at the end of the TV commercial where it says chicken your way, <laughs> how this, did your way was the this is the yeah That's this exactly is literally people having their way with the chicken and they <laughs> I even with that level of description they're like I don't know, I, don't know. I don't know is that gonna work I'm like how is it that you've accepted that you can watch a TV script yeah with a little play. Right, <laughs> little play, a, a little play. That. Well, I make fun of plays. There's a little play, and then it's a branded play, and that's going to sell something. And it's true, but how is that? Ex- why do you understand that? That and, so, and not right. Yeah, those those big those big changes, and then and then understanding that that um, that he, the the understanding that he had in the nuances, and how you could talk to somebody, and how you could charm somebody. It's much broader than just bringing the same fucking yeah. tools, yeah. you know, and the same. Well, and also, same... too, like going back to your point about about um, putting TV on the internet, like, yeah. and you know, I, we that's still something that we do today. But like that really changed everybody's. Uh, I feel like that phenomenon, subservient chicken phenomena, changed everybody. Looked at it, and they were like, "Oh, that's how you use the internet. Oh, that's yeah. how we do it." Like there. Right. That, that, and then later you got to make fun of that. Right. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> Cause everything is a microsite. I love to tell the story and, and I don't even know if it's correct. Um, the way I heard it anyway, this is the lore is that the verbs used for subservient chicken, like the things you asked the subservient chicken to do were just basically like an, e- an all agency email, like give us a list of yeah. 10 verbs. And it came down to, was it's it? It's not really true. It's close to true though. So, okay. so we did, we had people, and it was more than the agency, but the agency and everybody we knew. And we said, what would you, it was just was a picture. It's like, what do you want the chicken to do? Right. And they would write. So it, it could be a verb, but it could be sentences because you could put anything in that right, field. Right. And at, at about 500. That's right. This is true. At about 500, we stopped getting any new requests. And that is the mag- sort of the magic number of subservient chicken, given, given a, a chair in the room or couch in the room. So it's like a, cha- a, a a couch and whatever the other, you know, a chicken and uh, I don't remember what it. else was in. Carpet. Yeah, there wasn't a lot in there. So people um, thought they were coming up with the most outrageous thing, yeah. but we knew they were going to ask that because we had handled it. Long Which is enough. pretty amazing when you think about like 500 being the, the sort of like, okay, pretty much you can do anything with this chicken at 500. I think the sad, the sad part of that is we think we're snowflakes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we maybe aren't. We maybe just are like pretty much pretty coded. finite. We're yeah, finite. pretty finite. Yeah, there's only a few opinions that that we've got out there. So, so um, I want to touch on what he did with the um, Grand Canyon because if you like the Grand Canyon, I've never been. And well, you should go. And then you could while you're there, you could be like, "Thanks, Howard. Appreciate be- it." Because appreciate it because they they uh, 
he was working with the Sierra Club and they were going to um, flood, flood part it? of it, fill it, but but not, you know, not super bad, just a little. Just, <laughs> I can't even imagine and that was the kind of that today. was kind of their that was kind of their argument um, was they were just going to flood it a little. Um, what was I, I, I'll admit some ignorance where yeah. his work with Sierra Club was concerned. I'm, I'm curious to know, like, what was the the thinking there about flooding it? Why were they? Yeah, they needed they needed more power for Phoenix, I think. OK. And so Phoenix. I'm not going to say anything <laughs> I've never been there. Sorry. I hear it's I great. think I've been there once. It's nice. And uh, <laughs> and they figured out how to get their power. It's as far as I know. Sure. Phoenix, it's, still, it's pretty big. Pretty much. Lights are, <laughs> lights are still on in Phoenix. Totally. So the so it's still blowing. So it works out still shining. Um, but his answer, this ad is just so it's one of the one of the best headlines. Um, and it said, oh, should great. we also flood the Sistine Chapel so tourists can get near the ceiling? And and the reason why is because the when they said they were going to flood it, maybe 400 feet, the the politicians were saying it'll actually for tourists, it'll be nicer because you get a better view up there. Not so deep. Not right. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's not so hard to see the top. That's so um, mind bogglingly, massively yeah. epic. Yeah. So I thought his his answer was amazing. <laughs> Obviously, it has a coupon. And like any Gossage coupon, you know, there's lots of options about like what you can <laughs> do that, it, you know, boxes to choose. And and uh, so we're kind of running out of time. OK. Um, and uh, I could talk about him all day. I know I could talk about him all day, too. I hope that everybody who's listening grabs the book and uh, hell, get a hoopla while you're at it. <laughs> this I'm, is all I don't, a crafty I, ploy. <laughs> it isn't. I don't even know if there are any hooplas available. Um, if uh, I, I also wanted to thank uh, Justin Oberman uh, because he made me this cool uh, gossage sweatshirt that I'm wearing. He loves sweatshirts, Gossage. That's his thing. He loves sweatshirts. And 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 Justin, in making this sweatshirt, kind of reminded me that, man, we should do a show on yeah. Gossage. And then the copy on the back of this sweatshirt. Will you read it? Because yes, I think I it's, it's great. I will. It's nobody reads sweatshirts. People read what interests them. And sometimes it's a sweatshirt. <laughs> Very nice, Justin. <laughs> Little play. Yeah. Uh, and obviously, classic. love and uh, and lots of respect going out to Jeff Goodby and to Bruce for uh, ben Bedinger for for putting this book together. And Jeff Goodby's foreword is quite great. It's quite great. Quite great. I mean, I well know put. The words. Sorry, I, I'm trying to think of a better one. But You're a great. writer too, aren't you? <laughs> quite, that's what they tell me. It's um, quite great. Yeah, it, it, uh, it there's a huge amount of like re clear respect for what he started out in San Francisco. Yeah. And it's just fun to kind of like draw the lines between all this stuff. Right? Absolutely. Um, so I hope that you enjoyed the show. If you uh, if you want to see um, what Justin Oberman is up to, uh, he made the sweatshirt. He's up to other stuff. But you can go to justinoberman.com. As always, for show notes and links, go to thewoodshedshow.com. Is that the right URL? <laughs> and we... <laughs> And we will see you next time on The Woodshed.